This is a fan-generated show. If you would like to support us, please go to jamieglazov.com and also don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. All your support is greatly appreciated. Good evening. Welcome to this edition of Glazov Gang Standoff. Tonight, does Islam need reform? Our two guests this evening, Saba Ahmed, the president of the of the Republican Muslim Coalition, and we are also joined by Shireen Kudosi, the director of Muslim Matters at America Matters. Saba and Shireen, welcome to the Glazov Gang. Thank you for having me, Jamie. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. And we're going to have a discussion tonight, does Islam need reform? But I'm sure we're going to branch out and discuss several things. I think one uh, interesting way to start, and maybe this will crystallize matters a bit, Saba and Shireen, both of you are Muslim women. One of you is wearing the hijab, the other one is not. I think this is an interesting issue. Can we begin with Saba, you telling us as a Muslim woman why you're wearing the hijab? I believe that my faith uh, requires it, and I actually feel it's a protection for me, so I uh, love wearing it. It's part of who I am and part of my identity. Okay, do you have the right not to wear it? Yes, I do. Um, so it's not mandatory in your, in your faith? It's not mandatory in my culture, and as an American Muslim woman, I can choose to wear whatever I want, but I choose to prefer wearing it because I believe it's part of my identity, my faith, and uh, Muslim women are required to cover uh, their hair, and especially even when we pray, um, you can't pray without covering your hair as a Muslim woman. So I think it's very important. Thank you. It's very interesting that you say you feel protected because we could kind of get into is the dubious, um, a little bit of the frightening uh, background to why the hijab exists in the first place, but that's for another time and place. What do you mean by that you feel protected? Mm, I believe it protects me from a lot of unnecessary... Um, Talks. I don't have to. I feel like when you go out, it's people respect you more, and they don't mess with you. They don't want to hurt you, or I don't have to deal with a lot of issues that a lot of other girls have to. So. Okay. Thank you, Saba. Shireen, as a Muslim woman, why are you not wearing the hijab? You know what I hear Saba saying is that she feels protected. Um, those are a lot of the answers that other hijabis tell me. They say that they feel protected against unwanted advances, that they feel that they're, it's cultural, or it, it, the most recent thing that I've heard more and more from hijabi women is that they feel that it's their identity. But if we look at the actual faith, the actual faith doesn't mandate we cover our hair. Now, if we look at Quran, the Quran gives us such a detailed guidelines for civilian military life, but it does not give such detailed guidance for how to cover your hair or whatnot. Culturally, back then, we had uh, head coverings like we see with the Virgin Mary, but these are also cultural practices that we see that Islam also has a lot of cultural references to the culture at that time. Now, if we carry that sort of pre-medieval era clothing here and we carry that sort of culture with us now, then why aren't we living in tents? Why aren't we riding camels? Why are we using electricity? Why are we in this conversation? So it would be it would be prehistoric for me to cover up. I support any woman who wants to cover up, but I completely reject the idea that it is mandatory because the problem that's happening right now is that the hijab is becoming part of the monolithic interpretation of Islam. And that's a problem. Thank you, Shireen. Now, we do know, for instance, in Surahs 3359, also 2431, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you know, there's a lot of Islamists that point to these verses and say that it is mandatory, but, you know, maybe we that, that's another time and place here. Before we go further, Saba, would you like to answer to what Shireen has said? Sure. I mean, like I said, it's a protection for me, and I don't feel it's a prehistoric thing. I think it's part of American Muslim identity. And, um, you know, like I said, you can't pray without um, covering your hair. A lot of nuns cover their hair for Christianity. A lot of Orthodox Jewish women cover their hair or they wear wigs. Like, uh, it's part okay. of the faith. Okay, so. let, let's just have an honest conversation here for a minute. What Shireen said in some ways could be implied that she sees you engaged in prehistoric behavior. Saba, do you in any way look down at Shireen or consider her not a real Muslim if she doesn't wear a hijab? 
No, no, I don't. I think a person's faith is their personal matter, how they connect okay. with God. But obviously, it's a, a preference for me to cover my hair. And if she chooses not to, it's her personal choice. Saba, do you worry or are you concerned about or have you ever spoken out for the women who have acid thrown in their face that are killed by honor killings, that are mutilated, maimed, brutalized in Islamic parts of the world for not wearing the hijab? I think that's all despicable and it has nothing to do with Islam. It has, uh, obviously, there's our cultural practices. Honor crimes are strongly condemned in Islam. When uh, Islam came in the 6th century, Arabs used to bury their daughters alive. It came to stop those such type of barbaric practices against women and children. And, uh, you know, people who continue to practice such nonsense, obviously, are, have not studied the religion or are practicing yeah. our faith. Okay, Shireen? Islam is what Muslims do. And if we talk about Islam being democratic, it is in the sense that the Islamic faith has always been defined what, by what Muslims do, which kind of leads us to the question of reform. Islam has always been evolving, devolving, regressing, progressing. And so if we look at what Muslims are doing today, I don't think it's right for us as Muslims to say, well, that's a cultural practice or but original original Islam doesn't advocate these practices. This is what's happening right now in Islam by Muslims. And it is our responsibility to actually look at it in the face and deal with it, because if we are going to be so defensive about Islam, then we need to be looking at the people who are carrying out atrocities in the name of Islam. We can't just conveniently distance ourselves from people who don't behave in accordance to what we believe Islam is, is today. Well, and I love it when my guests help me transition to where I want to get, because you just helped me, Shireen. Thank you so much. So let's get into this now. Great introduction. Thank you for that. Briefly conclude, before we go to Saba, why Islam, in your view, does need reform. Islam, so from the day that, you know, from day one, Islam has never been a static faith. The number one thing that you will hear Muslims say is that Islam has never changed. That is a complete misunderstanding of what their faith is. Islam has always changed. We can look at Prophet Muhammad between the first 12 years and the latter years. We can look at Islam since the death of the Prophet when it became the religion of Islam and the spirit of the message was lost and Islam became politicized. It became the structure of Islam. And then we look at the last hundred years where all philosophy, all theory has completely regressed. We have the rise of Wahhabism. So what we need right now is to, to get rid of the structure of Islam and go back to the spirit of the message. Problem with that is the problem with not reforming Islam is that the structure of Islam violates the separation of church and state. And that's a big issue for us as Muslim Americans. Historically, Islam has always expanded under political campaigns. So when Islam is politicized as it is being politicized, the next natural step is expansion, which makes Islamism a greater threat than radical Islam. Thank you. Saba? I think it's, um, I don't quite understand the concept of Islamism. I've had this conversation with Zudi Jasser and I've had this, I think when they say Islamism, it's targeting anybody who practices Islam. And I think that specifically says 1.7 billion Muslims are apparently Islamist. And if you pray or if you follow the basic tenets of the religion, you're somehow a radical, which I think is completely absurd. I don't know how they define Islamism. I don't know how um, people are so... Uh, you can't box people into, there's no such checklist where you identify radicals by these five points or something like that. I think, you know, when you target all of Islam practice, uh, all people who are practicing Islam and tell them that, you know, somehow you're radical for following basic tenets, I think that's absurd and it doesn't do do any much for the reform movement because it just marginalizes and I, I mean Islam has been the Quran has been there for the last 1400 years it has not changed the message of Islam is peace and that is always going to be the case and uh, you know people who choose to misinterpret it and use it for bad purposes are need to be held accountable but we shouldn't tarnish the name of the religion Saba just one second but answer something that Shireen brought up that I think is vital is, an, is, is somebody living in America and is American, do you believe in the separation of church and state? Yeah. Does Islam, does Islam teach that there should be separation between mosque and state? I think Islam provides guidance to run the governments, and uh, it's different in Islamic countries, and that's why they use Islamic law to govern uh, in their 
nations. I'm not asking what they do. Do you believe that there should be separation between mosque and state in America? I think, you know, Islamic laws can help uh, guide a lot of policies, but obviously here we have a system of checks and balances and it's very dis, uh, I mean, we have a huge strong religious movement in this country as well. It may be Christian movement or, uh, you know, the pro-life movement, the pro-traditional uh, family values movements, conservative movements have been based on religious faith values but to say that somehow that's all separation of church and state and that should not guide our policies is not correct well Saba, i i think some might think that you might not be answering this question directly but we'll continue uh, shireen go ahead sure. yeah so Saba, i find it interesting that initially in the very first part of the segment you were distancing yourself from muslims who practice barbaric cultural practices such as fgm and now, when I'm criticizing the structure of Islam, we're all, again, one great, you know, happy family. I don't think you can have it both ways. Either we are one collective or we're going to distance ourselves. Number two, when I talk about Islamism, I'm talking about the structure of Islam, the political Islam that wasn't the spirit of the message that Prophet Muhammad shared, but it became the the philosophy that was codified into law so when we look at hadiths when we look at sharia the reason it's a big mess right now is because those were those were philosophers sitting around codifying their theories into islamic law that's what hadith is that's what sharia is that's what fiqh is that isn't the spirit of the message so when i'm talking about islamism we're talking about structure not faith itself there are two different two different things so i'm not saying that all muslims are radicals or all muslims all muslims are islamists but there is a politicization of the faith that's historical you can go read about it you can go look it up and that's a problem number three in previous interviews that i've seen of you is you talk about that you would have no problem if uh, Muslim politicians were elected, if a Muslim president came into place that advocated for Sharia, that advocated for Sharia-based ruling. And so that tells me that that answer is you don't have a problem with separation of mosque and state. Now, when we look at Judeo-Christian influence, it's there. But we don't get to just ban abortion as much as we would like to ban abortion. We don't get to do that. So you can't, you can't give these these answers that are dichotomies, and I know you mean well, no. but these are dichotomic answers that something is and something isn't. It doesn't make sense. Right, but I think, you know, when you say, um, I completely agree, FGM is un-Islamic. I don't think you should blame Islam for the fact that there are certain countries that have this cultural practice. I don't think, not nowhere in the Quran or Hadith have I read that that is sanctioned by- Excuse me, excuse me. You, you, you should do a better reading of Sakih Bukhari, but continue. No, that's what you cited, first thing. Secondly, you know, obviously conservative values are based on uh, faith values that come from Christianity or Judaism or Islam. I think, you know, that's what what we have in common with a lot of other faiths. We all share basic core values, which are very much pro-life and pro-traditional um, family values, pro-business, pro-trade. You know, I am glad to see Republicans in office and I hope to see conservative policies enacted. I don't think we need to blame religions for it. You know, we may have disagreements, policy disagreements, but we don't need to blame um, an entire political. Um, I don't think we need to blame the religion and its structure and ideology for it. But that's these are the facts. I, I don't understand how we're having two separate conversations. You're responding to 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 henpecked comments that I'm making, not the actual statement that I've made that the structure of Islam actually defies the faith and the spirit of the message that Prophet Muhammad received. And that and structure true. is politicized. That structure is politicized. That politicization is Islamism. Islamism is a problem. It actually is more of a problem for Muslims. It's ruining our faith first and foremost. And so I don't see how you can deny that Islam is being politicized. See, for me, I don't understand what exactly you mean when you say Islam. I literally just told how you. How do you define it? No, I how, just told how you. How is an average Muslim supposed to know what I are you just, talking about? I just told you. I've told you twice the political now. Political structure. I've just told, oh, told you twice. You just oh. don't want to. You don't want to believe that Islam is political. That in the 300 years after the Prophet's death, up until present time, that up until the last hundred years, these philosophers, these theorician theorists, were sitting around coming up with interpretations, coming up with a uh, theory that was codified into law. That became the sort of basic for the basis for the structure of islam and that structure of islam so continues what? to today i'm sorry what 
so what? Like, yeah, there's what a lot of What do you mean, so what? what? Wait, what do you mean, so what? There's Half the problem. There's country, Islamic countries that follow Islamic. Uh, that are Islamic nations, and you're saying that some uh, philosophers interpreted law differently. Some philosophers, sweetheart, no, not fun. some philosophers. The all the problems that we have with Sharia, for the most part, fit jurisprudence, the the barbarity that so we see in these in these dictatorships. We no. it and we should have our own interpretation now for the 21st century. Uh, I would just like to get you to recognize that the, this these facts exist. That would I be a great start. There are schools of thought. I know they have differences of opinion on various different. Issues. Where did that come but from? That's the structure the of Islam. Scholars, Thank you. That's Islam the structure. Scholars. That Islamism is that what you what you're talking about when you say Islamism is those four schools of thoughts? Is that no. what you're talking? When we when we take theory and we plug it into a codified system of law and we and we turn that turn turn that theory turn that politicized Islam into the faith itself, that's politicization of Islam. Islam was not ever meant to be political. But. Like that's how laws evolve. Even the Constitution, with you, you, different people interpret it, different religion. lawyers, different judges interpret the law, and that's how the law evolves. So you're saying that that's more important than the than the message that Prophet Muhammad re received. The message of God is less important he, he, that, that than that the message of philosophers. That message ended in the sixth century, and but that's the where way it was ended. interpreted. No, verse, church, hold on. Verse sorry. five three says, "On this day, we have perfected your religion." That's it. Yeah. That's it. So how can you argue that that's these things happen all over the place and it's okay that this happens in Islam too? Okay, let let Saba answer. Saba, go ahead. Islam obviously the revelation ended, but the way that it was interpreted was happened afterwards with the caliphs, with the four caliphs and the other folks who guided the religion. But I th and I think that should continue. We should have Islamic scholars study the religion and interpret it for the 21st century. Where I have an issue is where you say Islamic uh, Islamism and uh, it targets the ideology and the structure. I just don't understand what you guys are talking about when you, especially the whole reform movement. It's not just you, but I have had this conversation even with Zudi Jasser and I'd love to debate him again. I really do not understand what you're talking about when you talk about Islamism. Are you talking about the Islamic State? Are you talking about te ISIS terrorists? I don't know what you're talking about. Are you like, Maybe you, know, you should study the faith a little bit more in the modern context as I feel it, that it, I can't give you this lecture. Muslim, it does not make sense and I don't okay, know so how you what what checklist you use to identify it because when you call me an Islamist I don't know what I've it, never called okay, you, Saba, an Saba. you but, but One have. Saba we understand you've said several times you don't understand I guess maybe we can try one more time but I have a feeling you're maybe trying not to understand what okay, Shireen is so saying okay Shireen you want to try one more time before we go I would I would recommend that Saba actually maybe study Islam in the 21st century to see the the progress that Islam has made since uh, in the last hundred years alone to see how Islam has been politicized to look at just forget the hundred years look at Islam in the last 20 years in America alone and look at how Islam has become or being a Muslim has become a political identity so tomorrow if if Trump wants to go and raid the mosques can you even blame people because we go and we politicize our own faith when we politicize our own faith and, and we I, use we use the race card, we use the religion card to go and to go and get our to go and get our political interests met. How is that not Islamism? How is that not politicization of the faith? Okay, Saba. Four mosques have burned down since Trump got Oh, Saba, come okay. on. So there's 22 come on, mosques Saba. in this country. If you think all of them are military bases or if they're all politicized, that's complete nonsense. We that's go to not even what I'm saying. Pray. Not, no, no, no. I'm mosques saying. are supposed to be religious institutions, just like churches or synagogues. You cannot, you cannot politicize it. You cannot hold them as like p political bases. I gave that as an example to help you understand what, what Islamism is is and how it's being affecting Muslims today. I would like you to actually respond to what I'm saying and not jump on some yes. tangent point that I'm making. No, no, I'm exactly responding. I mean, you're an attorney, you're right? This, this is common sense, uh, logical argumentation from what someone is saying and you answer to that versus just jumping on something else somebody is saying. No, I mean, it doesn't make I'm any sense. To, you brought up the mosques and I'm just I brought up the you. mosques as an example and I'm talking about how American Muslims are politicizing their own faith and they're using those political interests to to make way for for you know phobias like islamophobia okay or, yeah w one second one second saba you have to admit, a lot of muslims are suffering hate crime saba saba 
It, uh, do you deny that mosques in Islam are also seen as military bases and that in America we have a problem that a lot of hatred is being taught against unbelievers in That's mosques? All fear of Islam and Muslims. I don't think that mosques are not military bases. The mosques are places of worship, just like churches and synagogues. Okay. And they should not be politicized. But what the problem is, is that Islam does politicize them. We're going to have to have a round two. We've got a couple minutes left. Look, Saba, you told an untruth in saying that there's nothing in Islam for FGM, which is simply not true. It's in reliance of the traveler that's codified, for instance, because of what's in Saki Bukhari and other texts. But we'll leave that for another time. Let's talk about something that I don't think we can disagree about. Let's say Surah 47.4 that says to smite them at the neck wherever you find them. Now, there are some people that would argue, oh, well, that's being taken out of context and it's defensive, etc., etc. The problem is, is that Jihadist groups like ISIS C-47-4 and believe it gives them an, a sanctioning to go behead unbelievers. Does something need to be done about that in terms of the Muslim community rising up and working to have those texts delegitimized and that this is one example of where Islam should be reformed? Well, I was just going to say, there are laws of war and all sacred texts. I'm not, forget about all sacred texts. We're talking about Islam right now. Go ahead. Yes, there are laws of war, but, and they, 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 nobody has a right to declare self wars. All right. What they're, what ISIS is doing is completely un Islamic. And yes, they are misusing the teachings. And we should have Islamic scholars reinterpret those verses and okay. say, is, figure out how they apply in this day and age. Okay. But we shouldn't be blaming Wait. the entire faith. Okay. Okay. So there should be Islamic scholars who should reinterpret those verses. Did I just hear you say that? I think they should, because they're, they're only narrowly applied. To okay, certain maybe forms. this has something to do with reform. Shireen, go ahead. Absolutely. And I can speak for myself. I don't speak for the entire reform movement. And even the reform movement doesn't speak for all Muslim free thinkers. This is a very individualistic uh, understanding of what Islam is. And when it comes to jihad, any sheikh, any imam, at least privately will tell you that jihad is the doctrine of war. Jihad is not just this personal, you know, soft, fluffy little struggle that we have internally. It is a doctrine of war. It needs to be seen as that. Yes, okay, I give it that, that these, a lot of the Quran is basically a history book and it tells us what happened and how the situation was dealt with at that time, which means we look at it historically in context. That means for Muslims to be able to do that, that means we need to sort of bump the crown down from this 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 elevated status in the heavens and look at it like a historical book and understand the mentality and, and the context in which this book was written and then not not stick to it so so clinically so so personally and um as if it's as if it's this word of god rather than the message that was delivered to a human being who then wrote it had it written who then recited it and then it was written down wait, wait, hundreds of years after straight. hold on i'm not that a lot of Muslims believe it's the word of God. A lot of Muslims it will is. tell you it's the word of, it is not the word you of God. You do not believe that? You don't believe that? Tell me where it's the word of God. How is it the word of God? The whole thing is a revelation from God. A revelation given to a man who then who was the recited it. Yes, he was not a God himself. Neither was, the, he, he, was he was a prophet. He was a man. He was a human being. So if we're going to, point being is if we're going to sit there and look at jihad as, as um, these verses and reinterpret them, then we need to look at the Quran as an entirety, as a book, sure. as a book, right? Not as this okay. divine thing that can't that can't be touched. One second, let let Saba answer that. Saba. Yeah, I mean, I was just surprised that Shireen didn't think that it was all word of God. That that was surprising to me. Okay. But, uh, I just find it interesting because obviously, if we're going to be interpreting words of God, we have to look at what the, his prophets thought of the, those words at that time and how it can be interpreted. Okay, a... we are out of time, but if I can just add two minutes to this show, please, very briefly, I know the answer here takes two hours. Try to do it under 60 seconds. Uh, we're discussing the Prophet Muhammad, and his conduct is to be emulated in Islam. This might be a problem if some of the things he did or said were problematic. Saba, is any... Is there anything that the Prophet Muhammad did that might be a bit problematic? Sabah. There was a context behind everything, and I don't think 
you know, uh, for me, he's our prophet and we respect him. Yeah, I get that. Did he do anything that, did he do anything or say anything that might be slightly problematic? Uh, I think it was all words of God and divine inspiration. And yes, it's not answering the question. Sure. You answer, answer. I don't follow Prophet Muhammad. I directly, as a Sufi, seek a connection with God directly through through whatever way that may be. But the Prophet is a man. He's a human being. And yes, he made a lot of mistakes. And he did a lot of great things. He made a lot of mistakes. And so let's take him off the status of this, this demigod who can't be touched. Okay, forgive me, but I think, I think uh, marrying a six-year-old girl and consummating when she's nine might be problematic when... Uh, the, the Muslims are following his conduct. This is for another show. Doesn't matter. Yep. Okay, okay. She was nine years old. Um, um, we're going to... 30 seconds concluding statement, Saba. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. I got a chance to flesh out my thoughts with Shireen, and it was interesting to hear her thoughts. Obviously, we do believe in the Quran as divine inspiration, words of God, every single word. And uh, Prophet Muhammad is the seal of messengers and we believe in him you can't uh, the the basic uh, testimony of islam is uh, you believe in one god and that prophet muhammad is his messenger um peace be upon him and so i wish you all the best but i don't think you can be a muslim and not believe in that shireen oh, took, i see sabas tuck fearing me so you're implying that passive aggressively that i'm not a muslim because i don't no. believe in exactly what you believe in i'm just telling you what i believe that's all Let's just, if you're going to take fear me, at least be upfront about it and be open I'm about it. I'm just telling you what okay. I believe. Okay. All right. Uh, Shireen, explain to our viewers what you mean. Here. So, Saba passive aggressively just outcasted me as a Muslim, saying that I couldn't possibly be a Muslim because I don't, my views don't align perfectly in sync with her views. It's interesting to note that, you know, Islam is all about peace and love, but at the same time, you just comfortably passive aggressively outcasted me as a Muslim. Because you're denying the Prophet. So, you do agree that you took feared me right now? I'm saying you're denying the prophet of So God you took fear me that, right now. How am I denying him if I'm saying he's a human being? If you don't believe in la ilaha illallah Muhammad the Rasul. How have I, I have I not believed in that? All I'm you, saying is he's you a just human said being. He, he's not, he's, a, he's not being. a prophet. He's just a man. I, no, I did not say he's not a prophet. I said he's a man. He's a human yeah. being, which he is. That's, exactly. So how do you, what you right do you have to he's a prophet of God. When did I say he's not a prophet of God? When did I say he's not a prophet? I said he's a human being. He's... All prophets are human beings as well, yeah, right? So how did I say he's not he's not a prophet? He's a human being. Yes, he's a prophet, but he's also a human being. He's not divine. He's not divine. The prophets are divine messengers okay. of God. Okay. Right. Uh, Divinely inspired, but they are not gods themselves. Otherwise, why don't you just go accept Christianity? Um, Saba, let me ask you this. In terms of what just happened, do you re uh, concede that in certain Islamic environments, that Shireen would be in much greater danger than you in terms of what's being said on this show and whether free speech exists in Islam? Of course. Yeah, I think a lot of people would, would find that very offensive when you just deny the prophet of Islam and you just say he's just... For the seventh time, I've not denied Prophet Muhammad being a prophet. Good. Okay, but what, what I want to end with is, in your eyes, Saba, is violence justified... A, about against a Muslim who might do such a thing hypothetically no I think there are laws that govern and a government and a state is supposed to execute those laws I, I as an individual can't nobody has that power Islamic governments do have the rights to enact policies and implement them in their countries based on Islamic law yeah. Yes, on, thank Islam. you. We don't live thank under you. that so, so but I, thank God we don't live under Islamic law Shireen last word goes to you we gotta go I'm Honestly, I'm a little embarrassed for you, Seba, and, you know, God help you. I just, you just took fear to me and you have no problem with it. Shame on you. Shame on you. Saba Ahmed, Shireen Kodosi, thank you for joining the Glass Off Gang. Maybe we'll arrange a round two. Thank you for watching the Glass Off Gang. If you appreciate what we do here, please support us at jamieglassoff.com and make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel of the Glass Off Gang. Good night.